Good to go? Okay. We finished our series last week about remnant issues, talking about the little flock or Peter's group, the folks that were given the kingdom of God on earth in Israel, and the body of Christ as they existed at one point in time, at the same time, on the same planet, and how they interacted with each other, and we covered some of that. Hopefully today's lesson, though not part of this series, may help tie up a little loose in on that, but it's going to be information that's not new to you, hopefully, but said a different way. Oftentimes when you teach, uh, hitting things from a different angle can help it click and help it increase your understanding. So that's what I tend to do today, talking about the knowledge of God, saving us from ignorance and idolatry. Peter and Paul, though they were given different commissions, though they were given different instructions to a different audience, uh, had in common a knowledge of God. A knowledge of God of the Bible, the God of Israel, the God who gave the law to Moses, the God who sent the prophets, the God who was manifest in the flesh in Jesus Christ, walked on earth, who died, who rose from the dead. They had that in common. Uh, he appeared to Paul as well, giving him a mystery and giving him a special commission. But they had in common a knowledge of God. And that's helpful because what separates you and I from the world, which of course is salvation in Jesus Christ, but it really fundamentally is about knowing God and His will, the knowledge of God, which includes that gospel, includes who He is and what He did. And Peter and Paul had that in common, you see. And that's a big thing to have in common, even though they had different commissions. It's good to know the same God and the same Lord Jesus Christ and, and that same authority given from the Lord, as they were both apostles with different instructions. So that's why they can get together and say, isn't it great that we know God and the world rejects Him and we're sent to communicate Him? which is why Peter acknowledged and gave Paul the right hands of fellowship, because he was preaching the knowledge of God as further revealed to him through the same Jesus Christ that sent Peter. So uh, that is how those come together. We don't face the same situation today among church denominations. That's not the same difference. Peter and Paul were not like two different denominations in the first century. and You can choose what church to go to, or they disagreed on different doctrines. No, no, no. They, they were both given by Jesus Christ instructions, one before the other, and uh, God was simply changing what he was doing. But in the world today, uh, we're filled with ignorance about the knowledge of God, uh, filled with idolatry. And if it helps you to think about why it's important for us to rightly divide, or why it's important to believe our Bible, or why it's important to get things right, it should really boil down to the very basic and fundamental and elementary idea that we're trying to know God implicitly rightly. Like we want to know him right. Not knowing him right is to say you don't know him at all. You understand? It's a false yeah. knowledge. Let's define some terms here. What's it mean to be ignorant and an idolater? Ignorant can be defined as without knowledge. Right? Without knowledge, uninstructed, uninformed, unskilled, unacquainted, which means if you're not ignorant, then you have knowledge, you are well instructed, you are informed, you are skilled. If someone does not have knowledge of a thing, they're ignorant. If someone does not know how to drive a truck, they're ignorant, they're unskilled. If someone does not know what's happening in the world, they're uninformed, they're ignorant. That's what ignorant means, without knowledge. Uh, that's what the word means. Ignorance, the good news is, is that it's curable. Yeah. Ignorance is not good. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, God lists ignorance without knowledge as one of the sins that he leaves humanity in. They gave up on God, and God says, well, I guess I'll leave you in your sin. And ignorance was one of the sins that he left them in. See, with God, you get knowledge. Without God, you don't. That's what the scripture teaches. And so ignorance is curable with God's word and with the revelation of what he's communicated to us and his truth. But it needs to be cured. Understand, just because it's good and that you're ignorant and therefore you can be cured, unlike stupidity, which has been said, will go with you to the grave. Uh, stupidity you die with. Ignorance can be cured. Stupid is not even knowing you don't know because you think you know and you don't. That's just stupid. Uh, ignorance is I don't know. If you can say I don't know, that's a good step to find, trying to find out. But you shouldn't stay there. People have the saying that says, I know enough to be dangerous. You heard this saying? I know enough just to be dangerous. Uh, and sometimes people hear that, which is a truth in the world, and they think, well, I should not know things because if I just know enough, then I can be dangerous. It's not knowledge that's the enemy in that saying, you understand. You know enough to be dangerous. It's ignorance that's the danger in that saying. It's that you don't know enough, right? I only know enough to be dangerous. Well, that's because you don't know enough. That's because you're still ignorant, right? So don't fear knowledge 
as if I know if I learn a little bit about something, I'm going to mess things up. Knowledge always helps. True knowledge, godly knowledge, always helps. Okay, so I'm getting some knowledge, but I'm still not there. Well, that's fine. Keep going. Right? You'll get more and more useful and more and more helpful. You can't do any worse than those more ignorant than you, and that's what happens. Okay? Let's define superstition. Look at Acts 17. Turn to Acts 17. Superstition is a word that is now shamefully imputed to religious people, or more specifically, Bible believers. We're not religious, of course. We believe the scripture, but... They call us superstitious, and that's because they think we're believing something without evidence. They think faith is something you exhibit when you have no evidence, and so you believe. If you have no evidence, then you must believe something. Not knowing that the Bible defines faith as the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so faith is actually in evidence. If you don't have the evidence, then you don't have faith. But Superstition, as, does, as defined in the dictionary and in the scripture here, is going to be the belief without evidence based in ignorance or fear. You don't define faith like that. Faith is not defined as belief without evidence. That's not faith. Superstition, that's what that is. Yeah. And so if there are people believing something without any evidence whatsoever, they're superstitious people. Yeah. They believe something happens. They believe every time the, the full moon comes that there's werewolves happening. It's like, what evidence do you have for that? None. It's superstition. Okay, it's an absurd belief, belief in the absurd, that's without reason, yeah. without knowledge. It's based in ignorance or fear. Ignorance, remember, is without knowledge, without the evidence of things. What well, superstition is. Look at Acts 17, down in verse 18. Paul goes to Mars Hill, which is a Greek philosophical center in Athens, and disputes in the synagogues with the Jews. Then in verse 18, certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. Have you noticed that in our culture today, which is rejecting more and more Christianity in America, that you see a rise in the popular bookstores among Stoic philosophy? Have you seen books written about Stoicism? Some of you have, some of you haven't. But they, there's an increase of it. And the same with Epicureans. In fact, there's, there's entire uh, TV shows using this word, talking about food and things like that. Yeah. You think, well, isn't it a food word? Well, there's a philosophy name for that, too which has to do with indulging your pleasures. Yeah. That's food. And there's the Stoics, which is to say you should maintain what they call a Stoic calm. In any sort of disaster, you should be impassioned about the thing. So you should not be uh, thrown about you know, with the, the events and passions of the world. They're somewhat contrary to each other because the Epicureans want you to engage with the passions of the world. But the certain philosophers, the Epicureans and Stoics, encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? They encountered Paul. Others, some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. You see that? So they, look, they called him a babbler. They called him someone who was speaking about some strange gods. Now, what do you call that? What do you call that? The idea that you worship strange gods or gods that aren't the true God? That's called idolatry, right? You see, the world thinks that Bible believers, preaching, preachers of the scripture, you, are ignorant, superstitious idolaters. That's what the world thinks of you. Right. The truth is exactly the opposite. In Acts 17, verse 19, they took him and brought him into Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine wherever thou speakest is. We love to hear some new philosophy. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers were, with, uh, were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That's the danger of the philosophy of the world. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. See, they thought he was the babbler. He goes, you guys are believing things without evidence. Now he's speaking to philosophers, doctors of philosophy, Greek intelligentsia. This is Areopagus after all. They're giving him a forum. He should be privileged and honored to be here before this esteemed crowd. What's he say? I perceive you all are superstitious. What, what a thing to say. What does superstition mean? Belief without evidence. No doubt the philosophers had something to say about that. Well, how can you know anything for certain, Paul? You heard that in the world today? You can't know anything for certain. Let me prove it to you philosophically. But, yeah, so I guess you can't believe nothing either. Yes, to believe is without evidence. Well, that's just entirely ignorant what you just said. You see, the Bible teaches a truth that is contrary to what the world thinks of things. And so we have to acknowledge that. In today's lesson, I'm trying to communicate to the priority and the importance of having the knowledge of God over what the world would think you should know. 
which means you'll be contrary to how the world thinks of things. We need to get in that proper, comfortable perspective. A superstition is what he calls them, superstitious. Now, people who don't believe your King James Bible will say that word is incorrect. Right? You can read the Bible versions and say, well, that word shouldn't be there. And thus again, we face the importance of believing your Bible. Amen. Why should you do that? Why does that matter? It can change what you think of the world. Yeah. You take it, this is the only time the word superstition shows up in the Bible referring to the intelligence, academia, the, the noble of this world. Now, you take that out. What's that do? You know, it could be makes the world look a little, a little more rosy. Maybe there's people with different opinions. Superstitious, that's hard language. He intended to be. He'll say worse later. In verse 23, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What's ignorance without knowledge? What's he say? To the unknown God is what you inscribed on your altar, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare unto you. They thought he was a babbler, a setter forth of strange gods. They thought he was the idolater. They thought he was the superstitious one. They thought he was the one that didn't know what they knew because we're Epicureans and Stoics. And he turns around and says, you're superstitious, you're ignorant, and you're idolaters because you're worshiping a god you don't know. And idolatry is defined as the worship of God given to that which is not. Or worshiping as God that which is not God. Worshiping a god that's not God. Right? That's what idolatry is. Divine worship is reserved exclusively for God. The one God, the true God, not any God, the one true God. Right? So if you serve and worship anything else as God, what does that make you? An idolater. Now here's the dangerous part. What happens if you're worshiping God and don't know him? Then you don't know God, which means you're worshiping as God, something that's not God. You're an idolater. Ignorance breeds idolatry. They're together, right? You and I, before we knew the truth of God and his word, were ignorant idolaters. You got to recognize that. Oh, no, I was an idolater. I just didn't know what I was doing. That's what idolatry is. You don't know who you're worshiping. You think it's God, but it's not. Now, if you just remain in your ignorance, like I just don't know, and therefore don't worship anything, then you're at least not committing idolatry, except for maybe of yourself. But as soon as you say, I'm going to worship God, even though I don't know him, you're an idolater. All right? You should only worship God. Well, how do I know God? That's a good question. That's a good question. But you should not worship as God anything that's not. All right? The world scoffs at Bible believers as ignorant idolaters. Paul says, no. I am not that. You guys. He starts off with, you guys are this. Therefore. And he goes on a God that made the world and all things therein. He doesn't even prove the existence of God. You see that word God there? He's not like, let me prove to you that God exists. He just says, God that made the whole world. This is my premise today. God who created the world and all things. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He's just stating truths from the Bible. Now, where did Paul learn this? This idea that God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Is this mystery truth? Now, this is like stuff you can learn in the Old Testament. But it's true knowledge of God. The knowledge of the true God. Because they had, they had strange gods around them. And he's saying, you guys don't know God, apparently. Let me tell you. God, like the only God, one God that created heaven and earth. Right? He's the one that made the whole world. And he's the judge of all things. Verse 25, he's not worshipped with men's hands. He's, he's instructing them in knowledge, isn't he? You don't worship God with hands. You don't worship God with statues. That's not how you do it. I can tell you don't know him because of what you're doing. Hmm? So you look around, you say, well, I see people worshiping God. If they're not doing it the way God says he needs to be worshipped, they're doing it wrongly, ignorantly, which means they're what? Idolatrous. No, we don't, I don't want to use that harsh language. I'm not simply trying to name call here. I'm simply defining terms based on the Bible so that we know what things are. We tend to, in our 21st century polite society, refuse biblical language because it causes offense to people, and thus we lose the definition of what the thing is. We don't even know what it is. We need to have the discernment of what it is so we can see it and identify it in ourselves and other people so that we can extricate that which is wrong, right, and grow in the knowledge of God. The truth is the Bible believers aren't the ignorant idolaters. Well, you believe that book? You believe every word of that book? That's superstitious. No, this is where we learn the knowledge of God. That's true, okay? The truth is, the Bible says in Psalm 96.5, among other places, that all the gods of the nations are idols. Hmm? That's a bold statement. 
It's not that there are many gods that different people worship, have different opinions about God. The verse says, all the gods of the nations are idols. False. Not true. Psalm 96. That's not even mystery truth, right? It's a biblical truth. There is one God. That's the first commandment. That's the great Shema prayer in, in Judaism. And all the other gods are idols. Well, wait a minute. I mean, the Hindus, they have many gods, I understand, but, you know, they're still worshiping a deity of goodness or something. They're all idols. It's not the true God. Right? Well, what about Baha'i? I mean, they, they believe even in Jesus. You know, it's not the true God. Idol. Closer to home. What about different Christian denominations? And Jehovah's Witnesses. They even take part of the Bible. Idols. They're the, the, the disciples of Jesus Christ are Latter-day Saints. Idols. Paul talks about another Jesus. Right? If it's not the true God of the Scripture, if it's not true knowledge of God, it's idolatry. That's the danger, and that is a grievous sin. It's the second commandment, if, unless you're Catholic, and then they take it out. But the Catholics change the commandment order, in case you didn't know. The first one is there's one God. The second one is don't have, uh, there's no other gods that you should have and make no graven image. They take out the graven image as a, as a commandment, but they skip right on to the next one. But, uh, which seems appropriate for people making graven images. But anyway, idolatry is serious. Why? Because idolatry distorts and corrupts the true knowledge of God. Yeah. Knowledge of God. What are we talking about? Look at Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. It's not simply this morning about pointing out where people are wrong, but I have to do that to show us the importance of what is right. Hosea chapter 6. Because the goal should be, especially of all God-fearing people, is to know God truly. Yeah. Is to have the true knowledge of God. Hosea 6, in the Old Testament, God spoke about his people and his land, the nation of Israel. And says that in the land, uh, knowledge, is, knowledge of God is no longer there. He says in Hosea 6, verse 6, I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. You see that? That phrase, knowledge of God? Remember with, uh, Sam, with Saul and Samuel, Saul learned a lesson that God wants obedience more than sacrifice. And he said that under the law where God required sacrifices. And even so, Saul, brought, Saul was instructed to go, you know, get rid of the enemy. He comes back with sacrifices. And Samuel says, what's this? He says, there's sacrifices for God. And we're doing it for God. And, and, and Samuel says, God wants obedience more than sacrifice. You do what he says before you think you're doing him good. Right? So doesn't the lesson that Saul learns there, that sincerity to devote to God is inferior to true knowledge of God and obedience? Hosea 6 is the same thing. It says, I desired mercy and not sacrifice. Sacrifice is the religious actions that would appease God's wrath. It's like that might be a religious good thing to do, a devotion to God. So I desired mercy more than that. And I desired the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now burnt offerings weren't even required for sins. Burnt offerings were those offerings they they gave to burn the whole animal up as, as simply a devotion to God, saying he is worthy of everything I have. And so I'm going to take this thing which could bring me profit and totally burn it up for him, to him, in devotion to him. I'm going to give it to him, right? And the verse says, I desire the knowledge of God more than that. If you do that type of activity, Hosea 6 says, devoting your whole life to God even, without knowledge of God, God says, that's not worth it. Maybe you see where I'm getting at here. If Christianity says we're doing all this for God and they do it ignorantly, God says, I prefer those who have knowledge of me, those who don't, devoting their life to me. That's what the Bible says. Now, should we devote things to God? Should we have adoration for God? Yes, we should. Right? With right knowledge. And so that's what matters, the knowledge of God. In fact, God's will don't you know God's will after being here for, for so long? You can't be here very long without hearing the will of God, which is clearly revealed in Scripture in this dispensation. Many places in Paul's epistles, the, priority, uh, the primary place in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, where Paul says it is God's will that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Read right through that. It's like, oh, that's Bible study. Yeah, it is, but I mean, what's, he, what's the goal? The goal is not Bible study. The goal of Bible study is not for you to say, I studied it, I went through the class, got the certificate. The goal is to increase in the knowledge of God 
so that you'll know him and his will and can live accordingly. That's the goal, right? You need a Bible, you need to study, you need to know how to study it rightly so that you can increase the knowledge of God. Yes. It's not just so that you've been through the thing. God's will is that all men be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Okay. Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. It's not simply here seeking knowledge. People talk about that. They say, well, we're going to study philosophy. We love knowledge. We love wisdom. We're going to pursue knowledge wherever it's at. The Bible says the knowledge of God is where you need to pursue. Seek wisdom and understanding of God. Right? That's why Solomon wrote before, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Because without the Lord, you're just pursuing knowledge without God, which isn't even true. Right? So it's just vanity. It's a waste of time when it comes to your knowledge of what is true. Colossians 3 tells us that Jesus Christ and him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so the scripture talks about God being true. He wants people to come to a knowledge of the truth, which is knowledge of God, and manifest Jesus Christ, who is the place where wisdom and knowledge are hidden. So studying the Bible, God's will is that we would know him, Jesus Christ, better, right? To know him. Now that, that, that sounds very watered down, doesn't it? And we, but we've prayed here before that we would come to a greater knowledge of you and your will. But if it helps you to consider why we do what we do, this is the reason. That we might know God, right? Because if you do not, you are ignorant. Even if you think you know something about God, if that thing is wrong, you're ignorant. And worse, it's idolatry. If you're actually thinking that of God and it's not true, right? It's important for Christians then to try to purify their understanding of God, to get it right in line with Scripture. Okay, God's will is to all come to knowledge of the truth. Now, what is known of God, how you get knowledge of God, is by Him revealing it to you. Now, some of you are going, well, that's Pentecostal. Aren't you, are you saying God's going to speak to me? Uh, God has spoken to you. Yeah. Not you personally, individually, last week at, at night when you dream. He's spoken to us through His words. In fact, there's many ways God speaks to, to people in the Scripture, through dreams, through visions, through angels, through donkeys. There's many ways He's spoken to people. Hebrews uh, 1, 1 says, in these last days in Hebrews 1, uh, he has spoken unto us, the Hebrews, them, by Jesus Christ. Since Paul, those words have been written down or thus inspired in the fulfillment of the words of God, Scripture. And thus we have a statement in 2 Timothy 3 that talks about all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable to make the man of God perfect, complete, sufficient. Right? But what is known of God must be revealed by him. You can't know anything about God unless he reveals it. You cannot, with your reason, your God-given reason, by the way, you can't reason God. You can't say A plus B equals C, therefore I know God because I'm smart. That is not true. You cannot increase the knowledge of God because of your personal intelligence or ability in thinking through things. You can't know Him. Which means very, very, very smart people can be ignorant idolaters or ignorant, period. Yeah. Ignorant of God. You can't know God that way. You can't know God either by feeling. Everyone has feelings and emotions, and if, if you're not inclined one way, you may be inclined another way to trust what your instincts are, you know, and, and what you feel and the experiences you, you, you're exposed to. But you cannot know God that way. That's what the Scripture says. Okay? You can only know God if He reveals Himself. And Romans 1.17 tells us what we all can know, whether you have a Scripture or not. Romans 1 verse 17 it says, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Faith, by the way, comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Amen. Thus, God has to speak for you to know him. This is, by the, by the way, why the world thinks that no one can know God truly, like you don't know which God is which, because they don't think God has spoken to them. It's very simple. People say, well, how do you know which God is right? The one that spoke to us. There's no other God period, but there's no other God that's claimed to be God that has spoken to you the words of truth. It hasn't happened. But as soon as you get there and you say, well, the God that spoke to us, like from heaven, that's the problem. They don't believe that, which is why it's so important to believe the Bible, because this is God's word, spoken, revealed, inspired, written down, right? So these are the words of God. Well, what's a big deal if you don't believe the Bible? I believe Jesus. You wouldn't know him outside of this book describing who he is. These are the words of God. 
Romans 1 verse 18 says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. So we have the righteousness of God revealed. We have the wrath of God revealed. So how do you know right and wrong? God revealed it, apparently. The world who denies God's revelation doesn't think there's a way you can know absolute right and wrong. That's the, the time in which we live now, philosophically speaking. They, they say, well, you, there's no way we can know it. They deny God's revelation in the world. There's no supernatural. Thus, there's no right and wrong. But here it says, God revealed righteousness. He revealed his wrath from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Why? Don't stop there. We see what's known of God is inside of us. We've got to look inside ourselves to find out God. No. It says it's manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. God reveals himself. Now you ask, well, what did he reveal? These people don't have a scripture in verse 19 and 20. Well, you're right. The invisible things of God of him from the creation of the world. It's talking about people before the Bible, folks. From the creation of the world are clearly seen. Well, how can they be clearly seen if it's not written on a page? That's interesting. What is clearly seen? What's not clearly seen in the verse here is that God is manifest in the flesh in Jesus Christ. And he died for your sins and rose from the dead. That's not what was clearly seen. What's clearly seen here and being understood by the things that are made are even his eternal power and Godhead. So they're without excuse. You can know if you're, a, if you're created of God as a person that you have a father, Godhead, a maker, a creator. We came from somewhere. To think that you exist in your self-awareness and intelligence and knowledge of what have you, your emotions, your reason, your thinking, without someone who begets that, who has knowledge and power and thinking, is to be entirely ignorant of yourself. This is what the world thinks. The world thinks we came from an ignorant nothing. That's amazing. How'd you get so smart, product of ignorant nothing? It's like, how did an ignorant nothing produce you? Uh, it was a miracle. You don't believe in miracles. It's like, how'd that happen? But that's, that's their only justification, by the way, miracle. But see, this is what everyone can understand. He's eternal power and Godhead. God wasn't born yesterday, eternal power, and Godhead. He's the maker of all things and the father of all things. That's why they're without excuse. Because if they know that, God's not born yesterday and he's our father, we've got to find him. They'll be seeking for him, won't they? Well, who is he? Is he going to say something? Where is he at? I want to talk to this God. That's a good approach, trying to find him. Now, God has revealed himself a lot more from when he first created humanity and from when he first created the world. And so if you're looking for him, you could actually find him. The problem is the world doesn't seek God. There's none that seeketh after him. They just stop at the beginning. I don't want to seek him. So I must not have one that I need to seek. Right? They deny him his existence. If you deny the existence of God, what are you lacking? The knowledge of God. If you believe in his existence, but you don't know what he's revealed, what are you lacking? The knowledge of God. If you have his revelation, but don't read it, what are you lacking? The knowledge of God. You see the point of all this? The reason why we study the scripture, we try to learn these things, we're seeking truth is for to increase in the knowledge of God, the maker of all things, the eternal one, the holy one, the just one, the one who is love and joy and all of that. We're trying to seek that out. Okay. Ephesians 3 verse 5. Look at Ephesians 3 verse 5. Look what Paul says. Now Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, the dispenser of God's grace, is the one to whom Christ last appeared, God manifest in the flesh, Christ in glory, appeared to him and revealed the manifold wisdom of God, and the one who declared his purpose that all men come to a knowledge of the truth, which means he gave truth to Paul to give knowledge of God. In Ephesians 3, Paul says, If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which has given me to you word, how that by revelation, you can only know God by revelation, by revelation God gave to Paul unto me the mystery, he made known unto me the mystery, as, a four, right, as I wrote a four in a few words, whereby when you read... These words that were revealed to me, that's a doctor of inspiration right there. You may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. You see knowledge there? He didn't say that you might feel better. You may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known. It was not revealed before. So if you go back before me, Paul says, you won't be able to know this knowledge of God. You can know other knowledge of God, but not this knowledge of God which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. 
If you don't want to be ignorant, you don't want to be an idolater, you want to worship the true God, you have to have knowledge of God. And knowledge of God comes from his revelation. And Paul says, he last of all appeared to me to reveal knowledge about him. So why should we be Pauline? On that principle alone. Because he has the complete, up-to-date, most recent revelation and knowledge from God, and he wants us to grow in the knowledge of the truth. That's going to be helpful. I didn't use in that explanation once the term rightly dividing. Right? I didn't say that. I didn't say you need to be a progressive revelationist or a dispensation. I didn't use any of those words. But that's what we're talking about. God's revealing knowledge, and he has over time. And he revealed it last to this guy. That's what we're trying to communicate. That's what the Pentecostals do, by the way. They say, oh, you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? We studied the Spirit at Pentecost. That comes after. But you go, yeah, and he revealed more after that. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, they missed that one. So, I mean, this is what we're tr all trying to achieve is the knowledge of God and what God, is, who God is and what he wants to do. Right? The knowledge of God is found in receiving the words of God. Back in Proverbs 2.5, Solomon even mentioned this. Proverbs written by Solomon, gifted with wisdom from God. Wisdom of the Old Testament, by the way, without knowledge of the mystery. You don't find the mystery of Christ anywhere in Solomon's Proverbs or uh, Song of Solomon or Ecclesiastes anywhere. But there's instructive knowledge back here that you can learn. Proverbs begins with, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, Proverbs 1. To perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Understand a proverb, the interpretation thereof. Solomon is trying to teach his son how to be wise by giving him knowledge that God gave him. That's what he's trying to do in Proverbs. In Proverbs 2, he says this, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, searchest for her as for hid treasures, make her the priority, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Yes. What's, what's Solomon say to his son? Solomon, in all his God-given wisdom, says to his son, Seek wisdom and knowledge, and you'll only find it in the Lord which should tell you in 2022, if you have a Bible that is the words of God, maybe you should start seeking him there. Right? Why do we start the Bible? Because this is knowledge, wisdom, understanding. And this is going to be to your benefit and that of others. Now, I already told you that Solomon didn't know what was later revealed to Paul. So this is why we are Pauline, because there's knowledge given to Paul that wasn't known in Proverbs. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, Paul praises Thessalonians, for receiving of him what others consider the words of men, but are in truth the words of God, which effectually work in them that believe. And so they received from Paul information, words, which Paul says God revealed to me as his apostle to give to you. Right? They received those words not simply as another babbler putting forth strange doctrines, but as they were in truth the word of God. And thus they increased in knowledge and a wisdom and understanding. So knowledge of God, if you want to know, have that, is found in the receiving of the words of God, which is going to be by faith, isn't it? Right. Well, you see, every believer has faith. Every Christian has faith. Every church denomination teaches faith. That's true. Faith in what would be a question. Right. Well, faith in God, obviously. Well, that, that's good. What God? Well, the God of the Bible. Well, okay, but what do you know about him? We're having a long conversation now. But it's important that we be on the same page about truth. It's good to talk about these things. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Revelation is God communicating His will and knowledge. Inspiration is Him working in people to write it down. That's what that means. Scripture is written down things, so all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Uh, it is profitable for doctrine, proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That the man of God, the goal is that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Why should we have the knowledge of God? Because it tells you who you are. It tells you where you've been. It tells you the problems of the world. It tells you what you should do. It tells you what your hope should be in. It tells you how to think. It tells you how to live. It tells you about the universe. It tells you about, it tells you about reality. Yes. Why well, you should have the knowledge of God? That should be your pursuit. 
Science was created that way. If science was never created, science is eternal. No, that's not true. That's worshiping science as God. That's idolatry. Science was uh, the function of people trying to discern the knowledge of God as it was in the observable creation. So people who believe that God made all things in an order according to his wisdom must somehow have done it intelligently. So we're going to observe to see if we can learn what pattern that was after. And so they observed scientific method, observation. And if we observe, this happens the same way every time. We drop a ball, it hits the ground every time. You know, it's like, that's interesting. So there must be a pattern here. There's a law. You know, there's something that's going on. Science. Science means knowledge. They're trying to get knowledge of things. Ultimately, either based on the premise or to end up with the knowledge of God. Now, you can't get to God from science, as every scientist says, because you don't find God under a rock. But if you start with God, that's why you should do science. Because the knowledge of God says, I am true, and I created the world, and this is how it is. Okay, then, if that's the way it is. You know, there's no reason for the world to be the way it is without God. No reason for it. The world says there doesn't have to be a reason. Then why are you looking for it? <laughs> Whoops. Because they're looking for a reason for all that is. Well, that's called God. Amen. No, we don't believe in God. Well, you just reject the thing you're looking for. That's too bad. God has revealed himself. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us all scripture is where he's revealed that. God has inspired and preserved a book of his revelations through time through his people, protecting it with miracles through Israel, preserving it through the miraculous in the New Testament and with Paul and the apostles, so that we could have it preserved in those that believe it, that see the importance of who've read it and said this is true and thus take it with them. And we have it here in 2022. The Bible itself is an evidence of God, you understand. How do you know God exists? We have the Bible, that's how we know. And I'm not saying I believe because the Bible says it. I'm saying I believe because of the Bible, like it as a book, as an entity. There is, it's impossible for this book to exist in the world without God. Yes. That's what I'm saying. Prove me wrong. And people have told me that. They've said, well, now anyone could have written that book. Have you read the thing? Have you studied how it came to be? It was just written by men. Seriously. If it's written by men, then the wisest men that ever lived are all dead and gone which is an insult to all of us because people are still using the wisdom of this book and the knowledge of this book to, to, to live their lives according to what it says is true. And it's still shaming the wisdom of the world. Yeah. How could ancient men without the modern knowledge we have write such a thing? And how could they do it over the span of a thousand years from different places with different backgrounds, farmers, vine dressers, you know, shepherds. Yeah, those are really smart guys, aren't they? Well, how many doctors you got in there? Well, there's Luke. He was a physician. How many philosophers? I don't think there's a single philosopher. Solomon, maybe. End of his life, he betrayed God. So, Scripture is God's revealed word. That's why we call it holy, the Holy Bible. Bible means collection of books. The holy books that God revealed. It's God's revelations. That's why it's important to study and to know what they say. Ignorance and idolatry are cured by knowledge of God from his words, okay? Amen. See, I don't want to be ignorant. I don't want to be an idolater. None of us should want that. We defined what it was, and that's cured by knowledge of God and from his words. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. You, you find evidence of this in the Thessalonian church where Paul talks about their receiving his words, as I said before. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. They themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Do you see that? It's not that Paul's presenting a God as everyone else can equally present to God. There is no infallible proof of any God except the one true God, because every other God is simply an idol. That is the truth. How do you know that, Justin? Well, you can try it, but that, people have done that. They've tried it and ended up with the, Christian, the God of the Christianity or given up all hope in anything. But you can also read it from God's revelations because God himself puts that challenge out there in the scripture. He says, try me. Try me, try the other God. See who it is. Right? Who of those other gods can speak? can speak the future, can speak truth, can speak about you, can speak about righteousness, can be pure in their, in their words and sayings. Who else? There is not one. 
Okay. Verse 9, Paul says, Thessalonians, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's the story of all of us, folks, by the way. So, no, no, I was raised in a Christian home. Well, okay. If you are taught the true God of the Bible, the knowledge of God, that's a good place to be risen. But we all at one point came from idolatry. Right? And probably the Christian home, knowing the history of America that you were risen in, was also ignorant of some things about God. Because your parents probably didn't know it all when they were raising you. You know, has that happened, parents? It's like I raise my kids and afterward I'm like, ah, I learned some things. Whoops. <laughs> well, happens to everybody, which is why everybody individually should pursue the knowledge of God. Because otherwise, you're being ignorant of things, just following other people. Thessalonians 1, verse 9. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 2, Paul says, Pray for us in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. The word of the Lord is the word of truth. The word of the Lord is, it, it gives knowledge and wisdom and understanding to the simple. The word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. Paul says, pray that as we communicate the word of God, it be received everywhere else as you've received it, Thessalonians. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Unreasonable wicked men. That unreasonable. That's superstitious, ignorant people. Don't have knowledge, believing absurd things. Wicked, that's idolatry. You read the word wicked in the Bible and you picture the wicked witch of the West or something, you know. But that's, the, the word wicked simply means a corruption, distortion, contrary to truth. These very religious looking and sounding people who believe in God can be wicked when they do not have the knowledge of God and in fact proclaim ignorantly a truth that is wrong. That's wicked. That's what it looks like. It looks like a preacher preaching wrong. It's dangerous, yeah. right, to be ignorant. It says, deliver me from unreasonable wicked men, for all men have not faith. You say, well, these guys, these preachers have faith. Well, that, that might be something I challenge you on. There was a study done some 15 years ago now, a long time ago, where there is a substantial number of people in pulpits who do not believe in God at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's not to compute all of them. Obviously, there are many more in pulpits that believe that don't, that say they do believe. But uh, there are a large segment, larger that should be, preaching from pulpits saying they don't believe in God at all, but they're doing it anyway uh, because they, were, they believed in when they started and they don't want to stop, or it's paycheck, or it's easy money, or something. There's all sorts of reasons they, get, they gave for it. So be careful of that. Again, not just trusting men, but... All men have not faith. It doesn't necessarily have to be that they don't believe in God at all. It could just be they don't believe the word of truth. They don't have true knowledge of God. You see, what do you call someone who believes something blindly or absurdly or ignorantly? Well, they don't have knowledge. They don't have faith. Even if they say, I have faith, and you say, in what? And they go, I don't know. In God. Who's God? Can we really know? And you go, yeah. Well, like, oh, the God of the Bible. Well, who is he? And they can't describe him to you. Or they describe him some way differently. The God that's living in the kingdom right now. And you're like, what? Like, it sounds like you're manifesting some ignorance there. Are we worshiping the same God here? The God that speaks my heart every morning when I you know, pray on the prayer mat and offer my incense and candles to him. That doesn't sound like the God that's doing what he's doing today. You're a person of faith? Like, no, I don't think so. You don't have faith. Deliver us from unreasonable wicked men. Now, Paul's not saying here, these people are terrible. Pray that I never interfere with them. You know, I don't ever want to bump into one. He's not saying that. He's talking about when we preach the truth, pray that I have free course, that when we preach and try to give the knowledge of God to people, that they would receive it, that they would no longer be unreasonable and no longer be wicked and thus come to knowledge of the truth, be saved and come to knowledge of the truth, right? Because what happens if they don't receive it? Then they're against you automatically. Because if you preach the word to people who don't know the knowledge and they reject it and call you superstitious and ignorant, then now you've got a fight in your hands. It's like, who wants this? That's what he's praying about. It's like, pray that this be easier than what it probably will be. That's what he's saying. Because we want that to happen. We're trying to communicate the knowledge of God to people. We want people to know. It's not a boast against others that we do and you don't. So that's what Paul's saying. Ignorance and idolatry can be cured by the knowledge of God and his words, and he prays that his, the word of God would have free course, because not all men have faith. Not all men have the knowledge of God. That's ministry. Ministry is communicating the knowledge of God to people that don't. Right? And at this point, now as I've set up the dichotomy, now that I've set up the fact that we have God's word in Scripture, and we all have Bibles this morning, and we have some knowledge of God, you know the gospel, the grace of God, I'm going to present the shameful problem, which is that, Christians can also lack the knowledge of God. 
You and I can lack the knowledge of God. Just because you are saved doesn't mean you have all knowledge of God. Just because you know how to rightly divide doesn't mean you have all knowledge of God. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're filled with the fullness of knowledge. That's not true. Right? So, in that sense, aren't we all ignorant of some things? Yeah. And if it's ignorant about God about something, aren't we idolatrous in some ways? Thank God for His grace. Amen. But shouldn't that be the motivation that we don't want to be ignorant, we don't want to believe things wrong about God, that drives us to study the Word of God, to read the Word of God, right? So what's that mean then when Christians, who are only defined as Christians by their belief in the gospel, otherwise they're not a Christian at all, that's a whole dilemma in itself, well, let's say a truly saved, someone who's heard the word of truth and the gospel of the grace of God, trusts Christ's finished work and his death and resurrection for their sins, and, and they never read the Bible a day in their life. Will they increase the knowledge of God? No. What does that make them? Ignorant. They cannot sound it because maybe they're smart or something about things in the world, right? But they're ignorant about the knowledge of God. Yeah. And if then they try to worship God to their heart's best sincere intent, but it's not according to knowledge, what does that make them? A Christian idolater. Yeah. They're saved, worshiping idols. Yeah. What if they know that idols are no big deal? Like, we know the one true God, we know who he is, and we're just going to go to idolatrous places to worship God, and I, you know, they worship this as God, but we know it's not. You know, there's a chapter Paul deals with that, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 9, and 10. He says, why you go to these idols? And it's not that the Corinthians are worshiping the idols as God. They know that's not God. But Paul's point is that what you're doing is not communicating a true knowledge of God. Yeah. So having a knowledge of God isn't just for your sake, but for everyone else's. Because if you have knowledge of God, then wouldn't you act as if that were true? You ought to, or else you're a hypocrite. You know and you don't do, or you do without knowing, either way. And that's pretty bad. Yeah. And so this is what Paul's saying. It's a shameful problem. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34. We studied this on Tuesday last week a little bit, where Paul's dealing with Timothy in his second epistle about shame and, and where shame comes from and how to deal with shame and how to be unashamed and not be ashamed. And, and this is what we're dealing with today this morning a little bit is this knowledge of God so that we're not ashamed of what we know but also what we're doing for the Lord, because we know that he wants it done. We know who he is. 1 Corinthians 15, 34, Paul says in verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That is, who you communicate with, how you communicate, the truth that you know, the knowledge that you have, the communication that you exhibit in your behavior, life, articulation, ministry, message, that will corrupt good manners if you have evil communications. So you better make sure your communications are true, are right, are good. Now, he's not here talking about who is saved and who isn't. He's not saying, if you're saved, you'll have right communications. He's saying to people who know the gospel, who are having problems with their behavior, that evil communications corrupt good manners. Maybe your bad manners are because you're not communicating the knowledge of God. Hmm? Like, they are going to, to synagogues of Satan and things like that. They're going to, like, you know, idol worship places and saying, no big deal. We know we're not of the law, and we know that's not a God, but we love the meat. Like the actual physical meat, you know. And Paul says, you're not communicating the knowledge of God clearly, even if you say you know it. And so that's going to corrupt your manners and others. In verse 34, then, he says, awake to righteousness and sin not. Because you know, it's a sin not to communicate the knowledge of God. Yeah. Now again, when you talk about sin, you got to understand, when you're talking about what's right and wrong and sin and that sort of business, you're going back to like law principle, right? Like the law brings the knowledge of sin. And it's not just you being ignorant of truth that's a sin, which it is. Not knowing truth is a sin. But knowing truth and not communicating it is a sin as well. And so, okay, Corinthians, you know the truth of God's grace, but you not communicating that is also a problem. Now the Corinthians would retort, no doubt, we're under grace, Paul. To which he would say, well, no one else knows that apparently. Right? Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. That's, what, that's the reason why he's saying this. He doesn't say awake to righteousness so that when Christ appears, you'll be saved. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say awake to righteousness because you're under the law and you have to do it or else you're not a Christian. He doesn't say that. Awake to righteousness and sin not, 
for not everyone has the knowledge of God. Now, why would my behavior have anything to do with what other people know? Let's say that again. How would your behavior as a saved person have anything to do with what other people know? Everything in the world. Yeah. You're the minister of God's grace. You're the communicator of the message of God. You know the truth according to the gospel of the grace of God. You know the truth of who the true God is and what his righteousness is and what sin is. You, don't you have the knowledge of sin? You're not under the law, but you have, should have the knowledge of it if you're saved. You have knowledge. And if you do not communicate that knowledge through your life and your behavior, then everyone who doesn't know God's never going to know God themselves. It ends with you. Right? And that's not good. That's what Paul's saying here. That's why he says, I speak this to your shame. The shameful problem is that Christians can either, A, lack the knowledge of God, and that's shameful because we have the Bible. We should be learning and growing in it. We've already established that all of us are growing and all of us have, then have ignorance. But what's a shameful thing is if you have the knowledge and you're not communicating it. It's like, well, Justin, why are you putting shame on people? I mean, shouldn't we make ourselves feel good? Because the shame... The purpose of function of shame is to point out something that's not good, right? And uh, we're talking about having the knowledge of God. That's the good thing. And you praise God for having it, and you ought to rejoice in other people having it. In fact, charity is defined in 1 Corinthians 13 to the same carnal people. Charity is defined as rejoicing in the truth. Whereas we've said it before, seeing the truth benefit other people. That's what charity is. Paul says that you can have all faith and knowledge, know all mysteries, without charity, you're nothing. He says you can give your body to be burned, have all sorts of charity, charitable activities, giving everything you have to others without charity is nothing. People think that charity is giving yourself to others, and Paul says no, charity is rejoicing in the truth, working in other people, which means you have to know the truth even to be charitable. You can't be charitable without knowing truth. Another way you can say it, you can't be charitable unless you have the knowledge of God. Well, there's a lot of unsaved people that are philanthropists. They're not helping people. Well, they are. They're clothing the naked. They're feeding you know, the hungry and all this business. Yep, and they're all dying in their sins. Yeah. If you have the knowledge of God, that's when you can really be charitable according to God. Right? You rejoice in the truth, not in equity. That's what it says. Okay? And so it's not about yourself at that point, is it? It's about other people. That's what the Corinthians we're dealing with. Knowledge of God is not merely that he exists. Everyone who claims to be a Christian will also claim in the same breath that we believe God exists. That's not what I talk about when I say knowledge of God. It's not simply ending at the point, well, I believe he exists. It's, it's not talking about, well, you believe in a God and I believe in a God, your God, my God. That's not it either. Like everyone says they believe in a God in a religious community, but your God's different than my God, and that's all good because we both believe in God. Well, no, the knowledge of God is that there is one God. There's a true God. But a lot of people claim to know God. They'll say things like, the God I worship. You ever heard that? Oh, yeah. The God I worship. I don't worship a God that, or the God I worship. Like, you know what that articulates? That someone in the room is an idolater. Either you or me. Right? Well, the God I worship doesn't do that. Okay, then. So one of us is an idolater. Which one is it? Like, if, we, if we're trying to pursue the knowledge of God, and you're declaring that apparently I'm worshiping a different God than you, or I'm worship, you know, I declare that. It's like there's, there's a problem here with our common understanding of God. Yeah. Right. And so the God I know, I hope it's the same one I know. Let's try to figure that out. Let's communicate that. There's one God. We talk about the knowledge of God. We're not simply talking about his existence. We're not simply talking about that there is one, even though that's also included in it. It's talking about his attributes, for example. Have you ever done a study of the attributes of God? And you say, need I? Why wouldn't you? Now, again, this is, this is a lot of study here. And I understand. I'm not saying that you can know the end of all things about God. This, Paul talks about the fullness of the wisdom and knowledge of God. They're past finding. It's just like, God, you can't say, read the book on God, done. I know everything about him. You will never say that. Right. But there's a book. And we should be delving into this seeking wisdom and understanding as much as we can so that we can know God, so that we can do what he wants done or participate in it, right? Knowing God's attributes, his character, his actions, his ways. Why would I study the Old Testament, people ask, and they learn how to rightly divide. Because you learn about God's attributes, his actions, and his ways. Yeah, under the law, but yeah, that displays his character, doesn't it? 
what he thinks is right and wrong. It describes his attributes, which will really help you today. There's a very good motivation for you behaving one way or another way or thinking how you ought to behave is to know how God would act or think about a certain behavior. And how do you know that? You got a big book here. So it's not wrong to pursue the scripture to say, well, when God was confronted with idolatry, he really didn't like that. And a lot of people say, well, but now he's changed. No, God hasn't changed. Well, he's revealed his, more information, but God has not changed. Do not be deceived. Paul says three times in the epistles, God still hates sin. Amen. Right? That's, that's my summary of it. Says, Do not be deceived. Do those things that those sins that Paul talks about in Ephesians are the things that the children of darkness, the children of wrath, they're the ones that God punishes. Like, like why would you do these things? So Mike, Paul makes an appeal to Old Testament understanding about the knowledge of God to say, sin is sin. And the fact you don't think that's wrong anymore means you don't quite understand God as much as you should. Yeah. You know that he saved you by grace. Good, that's what he's doing today. But he saved you by grace because you're a sinner and he doesn't like sin. He, that's the issue. He was going to pour wrath upon you and sin is bad. And, so people say, well, God's gracious. Yeah, he is. He's loving and he's just and he's righteous. And isn't that a motivation for doing right? There's no law there. It's just, I want to know God. I want to know God so I can increase in my love for him. Because once you know God, if you know him truly, you'll, you'll love him in that the things that he's made you to enjoy come from him. Right? Love, joy, peace, all that stuff is him. He's a God of beauty, says Psalms. I like beautiful things. God invented it. Like it's a reflection of God is what that is. So it's like you should pursue that and seek that. There's none that seek that for God in this world, though. They're all sinners. But when you're saved, you know where to find him in Jesus Christ. Yes. And God's word rightly divided. So his attributes, his character, his actions, his ways, his judgments, his identity, who he is. Well, the one God you worship is in Jesus Christ. You see Jesus, you see the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Like that's who it is. There's not much difference between the Muslims and the Christians, except that one identifies Jesus as God and the other does not, which means one is a group of idolaters and the other is closer to truth. Well, that's really going to offend a lot of people. I wouldn't like say that in my first conversation in the dialogue or something, but it's like that's just you have to acknowledge in yourself that that's what the reality is. They're worshiping a God that is not real because they deny the God that you worship from the scripture. Okay. And we're trying, we're told to be ministers and to present the knowledge of God that all men may come to knowledge of the truth. So how do you communicate to someone that you're worshiping a false god? Acts 17 has an example. I see that you're superstitious. I see you're religious. I see you're believers. Well, let me declare to you this god you ignorantly worship. Well, that's not going to catch a lot of flies. Let me say it a different way. Let me tell you some knowledge of God you may not know. Right? He's not worshipped in, say, that giant temple you just built. I mean, in buildings made with hands. Right? It's saying the same thing. He's not worshipped by passing around a little cracker in a dish and drinking a thimble of grape juice. He's not worshipped by changing the wafer into actual flesh and skin. That's not how you worship God. He's not worshipped by saying, we should try to bring in his kingdom on earth today. He's not worshipped by speaking in tongues that were only given by the Spirit at Pentecost. It's not how he's worshipped. And if you worship God, or if you give worship to God that is not how God says to worship, then you're committing idolatry. That's just the definition of it. Right? That's the, that's the motivation. I'm not, that's not your end point. It's like, and that means you're an idolater, and that means you're going to hell. That's not the end of the story. It's like, that's just for your discernment. So that, that you can realize the importance of why we rightly divide, why we need to communicate. It's not simply, hey, I learned something with the Bible. Well, yeah, but why is that important? Because it gives you knowledge of God, and, and people need to come into knowledge of it. Amen. Right? And so his attributes, characters, actions, ways, judgments, identity, his will. If you do not know the will of God, there's something about God you don't know. In fact, a very big part of God you don't know. You say, I know God's attributes. We study him all the time in our covenant church. We know all of God's om omni attributes and all of his love and all of his joy. We know those attributes. And he is a loving God and a holy God and a just God and all that. We know that. Do you know his will? We're still looking for that. What's that? Ignorance. They don't know something about God that he has clearly revealed in Scripture in this dispensation different than before. 
Why do we draw charts and talk about dispensational understanding? Because they're talking about the will of God that has changed as he's instructed different people. Right? So, and why, do we, why does that matter? So you can know God. Like, if you don't know his will today to dispense grace and peace, you might think of God something that isn't true, or think that God is doing something that he's not. And then you might either hinder people and shipwreck their faith, or rather be believing and trusting something that isn't happening, which is false. Yeah. This is the definition of idolatry, right? And again, we were all that. Paul thanks the Thessalonians that they were believing idols, right? Anyone, anyone here believe a false thing about God before? Well, praise God, you're delivered from idolatry to the knowledge of God and his will rightly divided. It's like, that's the, the praise, that's the thanks. And that's the ministry we try to perform. Because there's dangers in being ignorant. Paul says some 12, 13 times in his epistles, Know ye not? Know ye not you're baptized into his death? Well, that's something not a lot of people know. And that's something you might be learning still. Well, you shouldn't be ignorant of it. Don't you know? Don't you know? Paul says it so many times. In fact, Paul's the only one that says things like that. Don't you know? You need to have knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Solomon mentioned knowledge. You know, and knowledge is always good from, from God. But Paul seems to emphasize this idea that you need to learn and know some things. And that's because in this dispensation, it is about God's revealed words and believing the words, not simply a lifestyle or what you're doing according to a law. Right? And so you need to understand the gospel. You need to understand the truth of what God has said today about Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection for you. But he says, know you not that whom you serve, that's who you obey, that's whom you're servants of. So if you're obeying your flesh and sin, you're serving sin. I mean, that's just how it is. So you should serve God, because that's who he's made you to be. Don't you know this? He's made you someone else. Don't you know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? No, you're not. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Don't you know these things? 1 Corinthians 9, know you not that a runner must run with a purpose, is what Paul is saying eventually. You run for a prize, that's what he's saying. You see, there's a goal here. You're seeking for something. What's the danger of being ignorant? You know, I, I don't want to just know enough and just be dangerous and mess things up. Knowledge is not the problem there. Ignorance is the problem. So you should grow in knowledge. And the Bible can make wise the simple. You see, I'm just a simple-minded country bumpkin. I can't be a smarty pants. Well, the Bible, good for you, makes wise the simple. It's not like the wisdom of the world, which requires natural intelligence to, uh, to, to receive. It really does. And the wisdom of the world, you find that in universities and things. Right? It's like, you got to read books, you got to think 50 loopholes in your brain just to get through the mathematics of the, wow, no, I'm gone. Right? What's the wisdom, wisdom of God? Hear the Lord, receive his words. And suddenly, you get wisdom beyond the ancients. That seems easy. Well, there you go. Trust one book of 7,000. How's that? See, the wisdom of God gives wisdom to the simple-minded. Yeah. So that it's written to you. Right? For your benefit. Know ye not? But you do have to know some things. Being ignorant is very dangerous. Yeah. Not learning and increasing the knowledge of the truth is dangerous. Acts 3.17, they ignorantly killed their Messiah. Yeah. Whoops. If they would have known, could they have known? They could have. But they didn't. Now, praise God that he knew that would happen. See, God's even gracious towards the ignorance of the people that killed him. But that's dangerous. Ignorance did that. Romans 10, 3, people are ignorant of the righteousness of God, and therefore they have rejected Christ. That's a problem ignorance breeds. You don't know God's righteousness. Yeah, I know God's righteousness. Don't drink, don't steal, dress nice. Nope, you missed it. You don't know the righteousness of God. That's like you doing things. The righteousness of God is what Christ did for you. Yeah. So you missed it. Right. That's dangerous. That's your eternal soul salvation. Romans 11.25, the knowledge and being ignorant of God's promises to Israel being fulfilled. What's that to do with me? Because if he doesn't fulfill his promises to them, then he's not trustworthy. Romans 11.25 says, he'll, don't be ignorant. He's going to fulfill his promises, fulfill his covenants unto them. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. Yeah, those aren't for today. Do you know what the Holy Spirit's doing? Like, that's what he's talking about. Like, spiritual gifts. Because there's a Holy Spirit that's real, that's doing something in you, according to God's words. And if you don't know what the Holy Spirit's doing, or if you think he's doing something he's not, then you're ignorant. 
you're ignorant, then the Holy Spirit is God, you know. You could be committing idolatry by worshiping God wrongly. And you can also be very dangerous in communicating something about God that is not happening. 1 Timothy 1.13, look at Paul. Paul's your apostle. Paul's the one that God saved by his grace on the road to Damascus. And he thanks God for his grace, as we all should. Because before Christ saved him on that road, what does he say he was doing? Before he had the knowledge that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Savior, before he had the knowledge of God's grace, he was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. Like, it wasn't just that he rejected in thought only, but indeed, yeah. like injurious, he suffered people. He was engaged against the work of God. Anybody ever done ministry for the Lord that now you know was like, whoa, that wasn't right at all? That's what Paul was doing. He was doing it for God. And then he learns, whoops. He was a blasphemer. He says that now. He didn't before. But now he looks back and goes, that's not good. But what's he going on to say? Christ saved me by his grace. Long-suffering, grace. And that's, that's the communication, right? So, yeah, are we surrounded by ignorant idolaters? Are we? Were we? Yes, but praise God for his grace that he gives the knowledge of himself in the revelation of the mystery of Christ and his word rightly divided in this scripture that we can understand who he is and what he's doing so that now we don't have to say we're blaspheming anymore. But we can say with confidence, this is who God is and what he's doing. Even people who say they rightly divide, if they get God wrong, like, yeah, we rightly divide, but uh, the God we worship isn't omniscient. Idolatry. Yeah. You see, that's the seriousness of things like that. Right? Or the God we worship, Jesus, was not God when he died on the cross. That's not the God I worship. Idolatry yeah. is what that is. And so it matters, these things. Amen. It's not hard to get on the same page, but not everyone is. Not all men have faith. So pray that we be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men so that they may hear the words of God so that we can all come to the knowledge of the truth and all be according to the will of God with the knowledge of what he's revealed. Right. Where we're wrong, we should stand corrected by the word of God. Where we do wrong, we should be reproved if our motivations are incorrect. Where we're wrong in understanding, we should understand the doctrine that we may be perfect, really furnished in all good works. That's the motivation. We're seeking for that sort of purity in the knowledge of God. Without true knowledge of God, we are either ignorant or idolaters. Look at 1 Corinthians 8. When you read in the scripture, speak about idolatry, we tend to think, well, that's an old problem. Like before Christianity took over the world or something, as if that's occurred. I mean, idols are when people make things out of sticks and stones. Idols are when you make things out of rocks. You know what computers are made out of, by the way? Rocks, yeah. tiny ones that lay on the beach. We call it sand. It makes silicon, which makes chips, which makes your smartphones and computers, which causes those who wrote the programs for artificial intelligence to say, we're going to worship the things we're making someday because it's going to rise to higher intelligence than we are. Yeah. That's what they say. And it's like, wow, worshiping rocks again. That's what man's always done. Right? But first thing is, hey, we read idols, we say, well, this is an old problem. And I mentioned it before in uh, my brief travels across the world to China that there are still people worshiping idols in the world, physical idols. But even in America, there's idolaters, as we've been pointing out today. If you worship God ignorantly, it's idolatry. Idolatry is not just creating a statue. Idolatry is worshiping God when that's not God or that's not how he needs to be worshiped. Okay. First Corinthians 8, Paul says, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. He's saying in agreement with the Corinthians, we both know that who God is, who Jesus Christ is, what the gospel is. We even know that those idols are nothing in the world. If any man think that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. There's lots of knowledge that we don't know. But even still, if any man love God, the same is known of him. If you do love him, it'll be known of you because you're loving that which is true. And thus, people will know what you love, yeah. right? which is true. But if what they see of you is activities that do not exemplify what is true, then they won't know that you love the truth. They'll think that you maybe hold to the truth but don't necessarily love it, which is why you act however you want. Right? You see the difference? That's what he's saying. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things offered in sacrifice unto idols. And that's where we glaze over and say, yeah, old Corinthian problem. I'm done with that. 
What if idolatry, which is in definition what it is, worshiping God incorrectly? Like, that's a, idolatry requires a worship. It's not just people not knowing things. It's like people engaged in worship of what they think is God, which is not. And all that requires is that what you know of God is wrong. And therefore, you're worshiping what is not God or not doing what he says to do. If that were true, then we, if we replace the word idol with maybe the modern conception of it in Christian culture, which is that people worship God wrongly. Now, it's concerning, therefore, the doing of those things which Christians do in the name of God that are not true. What's he say? We know that observing things or being in attendance in places where they observe things to God that are not true is nothing in the world. It's just like you're going to church somewhere. Right? It says... But there is none other God but one. There's only one true God. It doesn't matter where you worship. It's not made in buildings made with hands. And everyone has an idea of God, and there's only one. But though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, there be many gods and lords many. But to us there is but one God. We know that, that to you and I we know who God is, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. Howbeit, verse 7, there is not in every man that knowledge. You know that what's happening isn't real. You walk into Catholic Mass, you sit down, you start observing Mass. You know that cracker's not Jesus, don't you? You do, right? Do the Catholics? Nope. Not in every man that knowledge. For some, with the conscience of this ignorant worship of God, to this very hour, do the things that they do, eat the things offered unto idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Yeah. Right? Now, who's that talking about? This is not even talking about the Catholics. You go to the Catholic Church, you're observing the Mass, and it's not saying to her, be careful of those Catholics, they're just not growing the knowledge of the truth yet. It's talking about people who aren't attending the Catholic Church, but they're seeing you do it. And they're going, why is he going in there? Now you're going in there knowing, this is nothing, this building's nothing, the, the cracker's nothing, I just like to see the architecture. And you're sitting there, right? And Paul's saying, what about the brother who sees you do that, who knows that Catholics are teaching wrong doctrine and heresy and are wrong about these things, and they see you going in there? Maybe they'll go, well, maybe it's not as bad as I thought. Now, that's not the thought you had going in there, but they don't have that knowledge, do they? What's he communicating here in this whole situation? Communicating that the knowledge that you have of God and his truth and his will and everything else, all the knowledge of God you have, is not what everybody else has. So your actions and behaviors communicate something to people who don't yet have the knowledge. And so you should consider how you act in deference to other people to communicate the knowledge of God you have to them. Instead of saying, I know it, that's enough, that's their problem, they don't know it, I'm going to do what I do. Right? Paul's saying, you might reconsider that. That's what's going on here. So it's not just... Do you go someplace and bow down to a statue? I mean, that also would be an idolatry. And if you did that, according to truth, it'd be meaningless, right? You know the statue is nothing. You're getting some exercise. Yeah, there we go. Yoga. Getting some exercise. There we go. You go down to the, the Muslim, uh, the Mecca there with the giant black box that they bow down to. They say they don't worship it. Yeah, right. There's a black box they're worshiping there with a stone inside. And they're all bowing down. That's some good exercise, folks. Every morning, I do some stretches, and I'm bowing down like they're trying to eat. It's good for your thighs and your hamstrings. I know it's nothing at all. But if you see me there with a turban on, bowing out of the black box, what are you thinking? What's Justin doing there? I like to exercise every morning. You know, I was in the area, might as well. It doesn't communicate well, does it? Now, like I said, can I? There's nothing prohibiting me. It's not going to change my position with God. It's not going to change my salvation. There's nothing unlawful about me doing this under this dispensation of grace. Under the law, it would have been unlawful, wouldn't it? Not the dispensation of grace. Everything is lawful, but not all things are edifying. Right? When we talk about the knowledge of God, we're not simply talking about, oh, those people who don't have it, but there's lots of us that don't have it, even us who don't have it, those of us who are growing in the knowledge of it, and our ministry is to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, communicated to other people, which includes how we communicate it by our life. Amen. You understand? So that communication isn't what determines our salvation, but that communication is important for your ministry to other people and how they know the truth, the knowledge of God. Right? And if you don't communicate it clearly, you're exhibiting to other people their ignorance, right? 
and you're allowing that to continue. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 7. Read down through chapter 8, 9, and 10 with that idea and replace idols with like wrong thinking about God and think of it doesn't teach something to you, which is what Paul is really trying to teach. Neither be ye idolaters, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 7, as were some of them. Talking about this Old Testament group there. Apparently, Corinthians could be idolaters. Isn't that what he's saying? Now, he's not saying to the Corinthians, I think that you're worshiping that thing as a god. Because the Corinthians, they were proud and knowledgeable. They knew, no, no, we know there's only one God, Paul. We know there's one Lord Jesus. We know that. And Paul even affirmed that in chapter 8, right? We, we both know, Corinthians and me. But he says, don't be idolaters. Okay. Under grace, you can commit idolatry and be saved. Right? Paul says, don't be idolaters. Right? You can be ignorant of lots of things and still be saved with the knowledge of God's grace. But Paul says, don't be ignorant, right? You can sin under grace that it's lawful. I mean, God's not going to take away what he's given to you freely by his grace. But should you? Don't be a sinner. Don't do that. Right? There's other motivations. And today, the reason I'm giving is that because if you know God and know who he is, and know his character, and know his ways and his actions and sin and righteousness and all that, then you know, and if that's what you love is the knowledge of him and truth, wouldn't you then communicate that clearly, Right? That's what Paul's saying. But you see how I'm trying to communicate this in the way you live your life is different than the way you would teach it under the law. I'm not taking anything away from you. I'm not saying that what God's given you freely by his grace is no longer given to you. I'm not saying that your hope of glory is gone. I'm not saying that you are not who Christ made you to be. At least saying the way we communicate the knowledge of God to people, which is what you're trying to pursue and do his will, is going to be hindered by how you communicate to people in word and in conversation, in life, right? So now we know the problem. The big problem is that there's ignorance and idolatry in the world, in ourselves, which is why we need his words. We need to study his words, maintain his words. Because even if you've learned it once and it had it somewhere before, you forget it. You know, so you remind ourselves, we need the knowledge of God. We need to be acquainted with who he is and what he's doing all the time. Because it changes our motivations, our thoughts, and our actions. It's why we read the Bible. Right? We read it to gain the knowledge of God. If you don't read the Bible or don't study the Bible, you cannot increase in the knowledge of God. It has to come from God's revelation. It's why you pray. Right? You might know the things of God in your prayer. Not that he's going to supernaturally impute to you some sort of, uh, of knowledge that, you know, by you sitting there and listening and meditating. But when you're praying, you're engaging with the truth of the scripture and saying, I believe this to be true. And I'm praying to God the things that I know that what you are and who you are and what you're doing. You know that the God of peace will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, don't you? Or know you not, that be careful for nothing but in everything. You, you, you know the verse on prayer. Right? There's things that you know and thus you exercise prayer. It, it's why we minister. Why are you, what's ministry? It's not going to church and listening to a guy talk. Ministry is trying to communicate the knowledge of God, which is why it requires a Bible, which is why it requires words, which is why it requires understanding and learning. Right? It's why our behavior matters. Because if you know God and know God truly, then you'll communicate him. Right? That's why our behavior matters. So the most basic problem then is not failing to rightly divide. That's a big problem. It's a big problem. Not the most basic problem. If you teach, as we're seeing in different groups, people how to rightly divide prophecy and mystery. And say, Peter had a different message from Paul. You teach that. People go, yep, I got it. And they miss 50 other things about God. Well, that's okay. They rightly divide. No, it's not okay. But you're ignorant about things of God that are important to know. The most basic problem, what we're, what we're trying to accomplish by the tool of right division, which is just a tool, by the way, just a tool to understand how to see your, the lens of looking at your Bible or believing your King James Bible. Say, what's the point of that? It's a, the Bible is the tool, you understand? It's a book. It's a tool that gives us the knowledge of God when we study it. And so the idea of believing your Bible infallibly, without error, is to say we trust the words because the words impute knowledge, and we need every word. And if you don't trust the words, then you just remove knowledge, right? You've made more people ignorant. You don't know which book you're supposed to believe. Now there's ignorance reigning. Instead of where did God speak, where do we find this thing? In a book that you can have right here in your hand, believing the Bible. It's a tool to get you to the knowledge of God. That's why we're Bible believers. Amen. Right? It's not just that we worship a book. No, it's we worship God, and we worship Him rightly. And we need that book 
to know what he said. Okay. The most basic problem is not false religion. I mean, that's, that's a big problem. The basic problem is that false religion is idolatry. It's because they don't have the knowledge of God. It's not sinful behavior. Well, that is a problem. There's lots of sins in the world. Yeah, I know. But that's because they don't have the knowledge of God. Right? You know, when you were saved, your sinful behavior didn't get solved. Right? Your sins got forgiven. You, you got saved from the consequences of your sins. Your sinful behavior wasn't what God was addressing in your salvation that you received by believing the gospel of the grace of God. Right? But he gave you knowledge, didn't he? You're a sinner. I commend my love toward you. God commends his love toward you. But while you're a sinner, right? He dies for you. Knowledge. He rose from the dead. Knowledge. You trust that. You need faith. Knowledge. You're learning stuff. When you get saved, you knew things. You, you, you have to know things to be saved. If you don't know his death and resurrection, you can't be saved. If you don't know who Jesus Christ is, you can't be saved. If you don't know that God committed his love towards sinners, you can't be saved. It's like, there's a lot of knowledge there. And everyone who's saved has that immediate knowledge. Okay? The knowledge of God, the knowledge of his love, grace, mercy. And as a result of that, sinful behavior is a result of not having the knowledge of God. In yourself, we still deal with sinful behavior. How, how are we supposed to respond to sin as Christians? This is a question people ask as they get saved. I, there's still sin in my life. How do I deal with it? Romans 6 and 7 deals with that. Learn more about the knowledge of God, how to respond with grace with your own sin. How do you minister then to someone who's ignorant? We need to find out what they don't know. Yeah. Okay. If someone doesn't know something from the Bible, which is everyone, then you need to find out what it is they know and don't know. Right? Oh, you're a grace believer. What does that mean? What do you know and don't know? Right. Oh, you're a Christian. What is that about Christ that you know or don't know? Well, let's study together. Let's, let's find out what the Bible says. Maybe you'll find out what they know and they don't know. That's how you can minister to people. The knowledge of God and his word is by finding out what people don't know and giving them what they need to grow. Because here's the thing about the knowledge of God. It's not simply like a puzzle where everybody has a piece. People think of it like this. They think, well, everybody's got a little piece. We can gather together. And even though they don't know something, they may know something I don't. And so we'll get together with our pieces and put it all together. There's a truth to that, and there's lots of things to know about God. Not everyone knows everything. But the reality is the knowledge of God, God is an entity, one being. It's more like building a house. And so you can't have the roof before you have the foundation. You can't understand the end times unless you first understand the foundation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's like there's things that are priority. And people will say, I know how to divide the living room from the kitchen. I can divide that very clearly. The kitchen is not the living room. The living room is not the kitchen. Different functions. Different things, different entities. And it all falls down in the dirt. But it's not nailed in the foundation. You see, there's knowledge of God that's important that we need to have. Who is God? Who is Jesus Christ? What is sin? What is righteousness? Then we come to the knowledge of the truth of God's will rightly divided. Right? We t draw a chart. The assumption is that you know that, but that's not an assumption we can take anymore. There's lots of people who are ignorant about God who are in churches who rightly divide. So this is not the most basic problem of failing to rightly divide. More basic than that is just knowing God truly. Yeah. Understanding his will. Paul prays then that we have spiritual understanding of his will and increase in the knowledge of God. The Bible rightly divided is important, but without the right foundation, it can be dangerous. To give someone a sword and say, cut that up, is dangerous if they don't have a cutting board, if they don't have the right thing they're supposed to cut, if they don't have instructions on what it is they're doing. So, hope that helps to understand our situation, maybe a different perspective. Any questions or comments?